Okay. <laughs> thank you, Tomash, for, for the introduction, and thank you all for uh, abandoning the be ber beautiful Berkeley weather to come and sit in a dark room and, and watch a talk. Um, this talk is going to be a little more, oh, reflective and philosophical uh, and a little less technical than some that have gone by, but if you'll bear with me, at the end of it, there are a couple, there are a few interesting research problems that, that I'll get to eventually, both in the area of algorithms and in the area of, of, of software systems. So I hope that will make things worthwhile. Um, my, my thesis in this talk is that for the last 50 years or so, um, graph algorithms and computing on large graphs have served scientific computation, have served in particular sparse matrix computation. And, and in some ways, uh, some of the largest computations that were done on graphs before about 10 years ago were in fact for the purpose of doing sparse matrix computation. Now the pendulum has swung back and now I think sparse matrix, matrix computation in general is, if you will, returning the favor to graph algorithms after, after all these years. So that's, that's quite a saga. Um, if you don't like listening to the talk, uh, the movie will be out um, in December, I think. So, so you can wait for that. But let's start with, uh, oh, let's start with Markowitz. So, so Harry Markowitz, uh, is an economist, still living, was, was an economist working at Rand Corporation in the 1950s um, doing linear programming using the simplex method to essentially invent portfolio theory, invent efficient, front, efficient frontiers of risk versus reward and that, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and in the process, he did matrix computation and it's probably true that he made up the term sparse matrix. Uh, this, is, this quote is actually from the 1990s rather than the 1950s, but he's describing that work. He says, I observed that, in most, of the, that most of the coefficients in our matrices were zero, i.e. the non-zeros were sparse in the matrix, and that typically the triangular matrices associated with forward and back solution provided by Gaussian elimination would remain sparse if pivot elements were chosen with care. Okay, he was doing a numerical computation, but he's describing a combinatorial problem in that quote. Um, he won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1990, not for sparse matrix computation, but for portfolio theory, but still it's kind of nice that combinatorial scientific computing has at least one Nobel Prize to its name. <laughs> so this is the combinatorial problem that, that uh, Markowitz was talking about. Um, um, we, have, we have here a matrix. Uh, I'm going to stick for the time being to symmetric positive definite matrices because that will let me not have to talk about numbers and partial pivoting and stability and so forth at all. Um, so my matrices are just, are just squares with black dots in them. Um, so since it's a symmetric matrix, its, it's graph is, is an undirected graph, right? Uh, 10 by 10 matrix, 10 vertex graph. Um, and what Gaussian elimination means for a symmetric positive definite matrix is, is Cholesky factorization, symmetric Gaussian elimination. Uh, and it produces a triangular factor, A equals LL transpose. Um, and as Markowitz said, uh, the triangular factor may remain sparse if pivot elements are chosen with care. So in, so in this case, there are uh, five or six or so non-zeros in the triangular factor that were not non-zero in the original matrix. And so we could draw this graph here to represent the non-zero structure of the, of the Cholesky factor. So the, the non-zeros in the factor are, are called fill or fill in usually. And just by looking at the graph, there's a, there's a very simple recipe for creating this graph from this graph. Um, which is we go through the vertices in order, that is we go through the pivots in the matrix, and as we touch each vertex, as we mark each vertex, if you will, 
we add edges between its, between its higher numbered neighbors. And if you think about it for a second, that's just describing the rank one update that happens at, at, at one step of Gaussian elimination. Um, a fact that's true, um, Markowitz, I don't think, knew it, but, but Don Rose did not, not too many decades later, is that, is that um, if you start with a symmetric matrix and do symmetric factorization, the factor, that you, the factor that you get is actually a chordal graph. That is, it's, um, it's a graph in which every cycle of more than three vertices has a chord shortcutting it. So that four cycle there, eight, nine, four, 10, is shortcut by the edge nine, 10, for example. Um, okay, if the, pivot eight, if the pivot elements are chosen with care, what does that mean? Well, uh, you have a choice of how to, of how to choose pivot elements. Here's a, here's a little graph, um, or if you will, a little matrix. You know, think of that as a matrix. It's, it's, the, same, it's the same object, just a different picture of it. Um, and here, here, here's the first vertex. When we, when we uh, eliminate it, we add an edge between its higher numbered neighbors, two and five. Then we eliminate two. At that point, at, at the point it's eliminated, two's higher numbered neighbors are five, three, and four. So the graph fills in completely, and, and, and we get this graph, which is, a, which is K5, which is chordal, sure enough. Um, however, uh, we're, we're free to number the vertices of the graph differently if we want to. Um, so, so if we perform a symmetric permutation of the matrix, so, so P is a permutation matrix here, um, we're solving, you know, solving AX equals B, this is, this is solving the same linear system, just with a different numbering of, of, of variables. And, and now we see, we, we eliminate this vertex, it has only one neighbor, so, so we get no fill. We eliminate this one, it has only one higher numbered neighbor, and so forth. Nothing fills in, and in fact, sure enough, our, our original graph was, was chordal. So, so that's the, um, so that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's Markowitz's problem, car combinatorially. I, I believe that the first paper on this was by Seymour Parter in, in, in 1960, who, who proved a theorem that in this terminology would be stated as trees are chordal. Also, also true. Trees have no cordless cycles. Um, Parter's, Parter's paper showed that if, if you have a matrix whose non-zero structure is a tree, you can eliminate, eliminate it without fill. Um, so here's, so here's the, here's the, um, Here's the thing. Here's 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 what we're doing. Uh, if we can think it, we can think of this as a as a sort of one-person game on a graph. Um, um, we repeatedly choose a vertex of the graph and mark it, and we add edges between its unmarked neighbors. The goal of the game is to end up with as with as few edges as possible, um, or equivalently, the goal is is uh, minimum chordal completion: is to add as few edges as possible to the graph. To, to make it chordal. And um, we, can, we can look at the chordal graph and read off the per, read off parameters that tell us the complexity of actually performing the elimination on it. The amount of space that we need is, of course, uh, the, the number of, of non-zeros in the matrix um, or the number of edges and vertices in the graph. I can write that as the sum over the vertices of, for each vertex, the number of higher numbered neighbors plus one. That's a peculiar way to write down the number of edges and vertices in an undirected graph. Um, but then it turns out that the amount of work, the number of arithmetic operations to do the factorization, is sort of a second moment of, 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 of this sequence. It's the sum of the squares of uh, one, plus the, one plus the number of higher numbered neighbors. OK, and this goes on and on and on. And this isn't really, I don't want to, I love talking about this stuff, but I'm not intending to spend a whole, a whole half hour talking about, talking about chordal completion. But where it, where, where it goes, where it ends up going, is um, into an algorithm that's called nested dissection, which is originally due to Alan George uh, in, the, in the early 1970s in his, in his Stanford PhD thesis, and has gone, there are, there are Many, many, many papers on, on, on nested dissection up through, up through last 
last year, uh, if, if you look at literature. But what it is, is uh, a divide and conquer algorithm for finding a chordal completion, for finding, finding an elimination ordering. As you would expect, finding the best chordal completion is NP hard, so you do heuristics and approximations. And this is, this is the approximation that turns out to be the most successful in practice. On, on very large problems, which is a, a fairly simple divide and conquer algorithm. We take our graph and we find a set of vertices, who, which is a separator, which, which cuts it approximately in half. And then we do an ordering in which we take those separator vertices and order them last and proceed recursively on the two halves of the graph. So we get this, this uh, elimination tree, if you will, this tree decomposition of, of, of the graph. Um, which is actually reflected in the reflected in the matrix too. You get these sort of nested submatrices if you if you if you look at the non-zero structure of the matrix. This turns out to be, as I said, generally speaking, the most successful approach in practice for very large matrices. Although it's not the one that Markowitz used, um, and it also turns out to be the right thing to do in theory. It turns out that if you can approximate optimal separators in a graph, you can approximate optimal chordal completion. Um, Guy Blellett talked about separators a little bit this morning. Um, um, many of the graphs that come up in scientific computing have natural embeddings in two dimensions or three dimensions because they're representing two or three dimensional physical problems of some sort. And the graphs that discretize those, those, those problems tend to have separators. Planar graphs have square root of n separators, of course, Lipton and Tarjan. Um, Well-shaped finite element meshes in three dimensions have separators of size n to the two-thirds vertices, which is what you get by cutting a cube in half. That's a theorem that took many years to prove, um, not because it was such a hard theorem, but because you needed the right definition of, of what exactly it meant to have a graph that was embedded in three dimensions, because any graph can be embedded in three dimensions, right? Um, there are separator theorems for some other classes of graphs. Most of them come with efficient algorithms, but nobody uses them because, in fact, in practice, heuristics do all right. Um, and, and here, uh, maybe to just finish off talking about separators, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that, that, that graph separator heuristics, um, graph partitioning heuristics have been an active area of research for, for many, many years uh, with lots of different applications, but for a long time for, with, with the application of, 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 of sparse direct methods here. And so here are some uh, heuristics that have been used. The sparse direct methods community was doing spectral partitioning fairly early, and there are, there are lots of other things. Um, Guy this morning mentioned the Metis code, which is one of the what you would consider a modern graph partitioning heuristic. Most of the modern codes use a sort of multi-level iterative swapping, uh, well, I, I'll just say multi-level iterative swapping approach. So OK, so that was, that was a lot about one particular place that graph algorithms show up in sparse matrix computation. But in fact, in fact they're ubiquitous. Um, there were, there were many, many graph algorithms that have been either used or invented for the purpose or, at any case, implemented at fairly large scale, or a large scale for the time at least, for, for the purpose of doing sparse matrix computation. So in the symmetric uh, factorization problems that we've been talking about, there are algorithms on trees, um, algorithms to predict the non-zero structure of the output of a matrix computation without actually performing the computation, um, sparse triangular solve, sparse, sparse this, sparse that. Um, um, given an elimination order, you can, you can reorder the elimination tree efficiently, actually, to, to have minimum, minimum, uh, minimum span, minimum parallel height, and so forth. Um, for non-symmetric direct methods, you get, again, algorithms for sparse triangular solves. Bipartite matching comes in um, um, crucially in non-symmetric problems. Uh, strongly connected components or, or its generalization, Vilmage Mendelssohn decomposition, and so forth. And then, of course, um, um, iterative methods for solving systems of linear equations also are, are, full of, are full of graph algorithms. Graph partitioning shows up again 
uh, this time for the purpose of partitioning a problem for parallel computation. Uh, independent sets and coloring come in for, for, for preconditioning of various kinds. Low stretch spanning trees show up for preconditionings of various kinds. Ivan Toledo tomorrow will give a talk that has low stretch spanning trees in it. Um, and, and, and so forth and so on. Uh, let, me not, let me not, as I say, let me not go on and on about graph algorithms. I could, I could mention one, one last one, which is, which is this, I said, sparse triangular solve, because this actually looks a little bit like, um, this actually looks a little bit like, like some big graph probing problem. So what we're given is, is a big DAG, a big directed acyclic graph, and a very, a very sparse right-hand side vector, and we want to compute the answer to the linear system, which is it, itself expected to be sparse. And so what that means is, is search in the graph to find out where the non-zeros are going to be, and then proceed in topological order to, to actually compute, compute the values. And that, that gets used in, in, in lots of these codes. OK. So, so sparse Cholesky factorization, preordering. All of this stuff is done in, in approximately, in, in nearly linear time in the size of the data. Then the numerical factorization goes blindingly fast because it can use a static data structure and because it can use BLAS3 to reduce memory traffic. BLAS3, what's that? OK. Um, um, so this goes back to the graph theory again. Um, chordal graphs have a nice natural representation. A chordal graph is a tree of overlapping cliques. Um, a clique is a dense, uh, a, a clique is a complete subgraph. A complete subgraph is a dense matrix, and dense matrix operation, operations do n cubed work on n squared data, and therefore use memory efficiently. And so because of this fact, that a chordal graph can be represented as cliques, most of the actual arithmetic in Gaussian elimination can be done in, in dense matrix computation. Um, um, this is just a picture of that. Um, oh, this is an aside. I want you to remember this until the very end of the talk, although you don't have to remember the details of it. Um, if you're in a non-symmetric world, so, so now you want an A equals LU factorization, and you need to do partial pivoting. You need to do numerical pivoting for, for stability. All you can, well, one, one thing that you can do is reorder columns for, for all these combinatorial things. And then it turns out that um, column permutations of this matrix look like symmetric permutations of the symmetric positive definite matrix A transpose A. And so you would sort of like to carry over all this technology. And the point that I want you to remember till the end is that um, over the years, the, the sparse matrix folks have figured out how to do all these combinatorial things on the graph of A transpose A without actually forming it, based on, based on a data structure for A. It's mostly not that hard, but it's a bunch of special cases. OK. Um, so in summary, uh, linear algebra occupies a sort of magical position as the middleware of scientific computing if you will. Um, by middleware, I mean that traditional scientific computing is usually trying to model the physical world. The mathematics is usually differential equations of some sort, uh, uh, real numbers, continuous problems, infinite field, you know, uh, things that are not really too good a match to, to the add, subtract, multiply, divide things that, that computers do. Um, so linear algebra sort of sits in the middle, uh, translating, discretizing, approximating, linearizing um, these continuous problems into add, subtract, multiply, divide problems, things that, things that computers can do. OK. And the pendulum swings back. So now here we are um, at a conference where we're not talking about, well, some of us are talking about physical modeling, but, but mostly we're talking about big data analysis problems, analyzing discrete structures where the problem starts out as a discrete problem. It doesn't start out as, as, a, as a differential equation or, a, or a, a, a figure in three space. We have the same computers, add, subtract, multiply, divide at the bottom. And so presumably the mathematical middleware that goes here is graph theory. So, 50 years of computational linear algebra have gotten us really, really good at, at executing this, this schema for, for physical modeling. 
Um, presumably, we just plug in graph theory instead of linear algebra, and, 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 and this works too. So how's that going? Well, um, linear algebra and graph theory uh, both have standard benchmarks that, that, that you've heard about here. Um, um, for, for, for linear algebra, for floating point computation, the benchmark is something called the top 500 benchmark or, or the LINPACK benchmark. Um, it's essentially a floating point computation benchmark. Uh, the benchmark is to solve a large system of linear equations by Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting. Um, and every six months since the early 1970s sometime, um, the, the top 500 organization has, has uh, created a, a, uh, a list of the fastest machines in the world by this definition. And so the last list was at the June European Supercomputing Conference. The next one will come out next month at the, at the Supercomputing Conference here, uh, here in Denver. Um, um, and the top of the list at the moment, which you can't read here, is uh, the, the, the rate you measure is, ter is flops, floating point operations per second. And the top, the top, uh, the, the, the winner is, is 33 point something petaflops. So there's also a graph 500 benchmark, which you've heard mentioned a couple of times here. This is much newer. It's only been around for about three years. But the goals of the list are quite similar every six months. To, to, to run the benchmark on as many machines as possible. There aren't 500 of them yet on the list, so you can get your iPhone on the, on the Graph 500 list if you want to. Um, um, but the, but uh, the benchmark here is, again, a computational kernel, in this case, breadth-first search in a large power law graph, a randomly generated approximately power law graph, an RMAT graph. Um, and the rate now is measured in terms of fundamental operations, which are called TEPs, edges traver traversed edges per second, since there's no floating point in this computation. And here are the winners. And the winner at the moment is, is this uh, blue jean machine at, at Livermore. Um, um, and here's the rate, 15.3 uh, gigateps. Billions and billions of edges per second. So, so how does that compare? As of, as of last summer, we could do floating point at 33 petaflops and, and graphs at 15 tera taps, and the ratio is about 2,000 or so. Um, so. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we're 2,000 times worse at doing graph computation than, than, than matrix computation? Probably not, not, not really. Um, it, I think it means two things. One is, one is that this is a harder computation than this. When this benchmark was defined, the hard thing was to do a floating point arithmetic computation. But nowadays, arithmetic is practically free, and communication is what costs money. Moving data is what costs energy and time. Um, and a random graph, traversing a random graph, moves a lot of moves a lot of data around. So maybe maybe two orders of mag three orders of magnitude isn't surprising, but the number that I think is more interesting is to look historically. You can't go very far back. The Graph 500 benchmark is three years old now, but three years ago, um, the ratio was 400,000. So this ratio has gone down by a factor of almost 200 in two and a half years. Um, um, and so what does this say? In, in, in three years, two and a half petaflops to 33 petaflops, we haven't really learned anything new about how you do dense Gaussian elimination. We've just built machines with more cores and more memory and maybe faster clocks since, since, since 2010. And that's this gain. But nobody's built machines in the last two and a half years that are 200 times as good at doing graph computations as, as, as they were three years ago. Most of this gain is computer science. Most of this gain is, is, is algorithms and software and just figuring, figuring out how to do this problem right. And, and this, is, this is in some way sort of maybe the most important part of the talk. But let me, but let me go on. Um, um, OK, so a lot, of, a lot of the gain, a lot of what was learned in doing the top 500 benchmark and, uh, and all the other numerical computations of the last 50 years is that primitives matter. So this is a, this is a chart 
that I probably stole from either Kathy Yellick or Larry Carter. I'm not sure who. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very old chart that shows um, as a proportion of the peak floating point rate of a machine, how fast as a function of the size of a vector or a matrix does a, prim a basic primitive go. And the basic primitives here are blas one, vector vector operations, matrix vector operations, and matrix matrix operations. Of course, the big gain at, at the blas three level is that you get the n, n cubed work for n squared, n squared data movement. So, so what we're learning now is how to do Common, is, is what the right primitives for combinatorial computation should be. So what should the combinatorial blahs look like? This is an old slide. I showed this slide, I, I showed, I showed this slide several years ago um, um, when, when Aydin Buluch was a graduate student. And, and as graduate students tend to be a little confused, he, he somehow thought it was a thesis topic um, rather, than a, rather than a talk. And so, and so Aydin, Aydin yesterday gave a talk about, about um, Using, using sparse arrays and sparse matrices over semi-rings as computational primitives for graph computation. I won't, I won't, I won't repeat all of that. The canonical example is, is breadth-first search. This is a multi-source breadth-first search here written as a matrix problem, here written as a graph problem. Again, they're the same picture. They're, they're even the same data structures and the same work. They're just, they're just slightly different drawings of it. One thing about draw, writing it this way, though, is that you automatically get a lot of different ways to get parallelism, right? Columns of X are parallelism over different searches. Columns of A is parallelism over vertices in a frontier. Rows of A is parallelism over the edges out of a single high degree vertex. And so you can do other things. You can do graph contraction and subgraph extraction. You can do between the centrality if you want, thanks to, thanks to Eric Robinson. Uh, you can actually do all sorts of things. Jeremy Kepner a few years ago did a, did a study about, about trying to do fundamental graph algorithms in the language of linear algebra. And, and uh, he and I, a couple of years ago, even, even wrote a book about it. Um, one of the points, as Aiden mentioned, is that these are matrices over arbitrary semi-rings. Uh, the point is that the computations have the same data reference pattern and control flow no matter what the, no the semi-ring is. So, so the semi-ring you know, might be the real field, it might be Booleans, it might be the tropical, the, the shortest paths semi-ring. Really, the way to think of a semi-ring in this sort of thing is that the objects are attributes on the edges of vertices, and there's an aggregation operation that happens at vertices, and there's some kind of inter-vertex data processing thing that happens, that happens on edges. And so if you specify those, you get, you get, you get a semi-ring computation. Um, so, so let me, so let me, let me uh, gee, I promised to ask some questions. So let me ask some questions real quick. Um, um, John Barry at Sandia is the architect of the multi Sandia multi-threaded graph library, one of the most successful uh, uh, um, large-scale graph libraries, and, and is, is the loyal opposition for, for, for us on this project. And so, and so he, he uh, oh, a year or so ago, gave us a set of, uh, gave us, uh, expounded a set of challenge problems for, for, for the linear algebra approach. And so, and so I, I give them to you. We know how to do many of them efficiently. Uh, you can do anything in anything, of course, but we know how to do most, but not all of those efficiently in linear algebra. Um, another question, this is probably a good place to end, but I told you to keep this question in mind till the end, so I guess I owe you an explanation of why. Um, um, remember that, that the sparse matrix people knew how to do all these, all these algorithms on, on A transpose A without forming A transpose A. When you write down a graph algorithm as, a lin as, as, as linear algebra, um, often what happens is that you're sort of artificially inserting uh, BSP steps or barriers in between pieces of the computation. And 
you often would like to do that without storing all those intermediate results. So, so Joy Gonzalez yesterday talked about Graph Lab, about, about his graph parallelism. And one of the, you know, it's, it's the same idea of aggregating things across edges at vertices. But one of the important parts of that is, is, is scheduling, is sort of not dividing it into, 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 um, into these, into these, uh, into these sort of artificial giant steps. Um, um, boil the ocean. I don't have time to talk about boiling the ocean. We'll boi boil the ocean some other time. Um, let me finish by going back to the blahs, the numerical blahs. It's hard to overstate the impact that the development, the definition of the blahs have had on numerical scientific com com computation over the last 40 years. Um, um, they really have made it possible to separate concerns between experts in mapping algorithms onto hardware who can make the blahs run fast and experts in linear algebra who can build software on top of the blahs that will run fast for free, more or less. So what about graphs? Could we define the graph blahs? Well, my answer to that question is no and yes. Um, no, I don't think we're anywhere near ready to standardize tools for graph algorithms. There's, you know, huge diversity in what kinds of algorithms, how people match algorithms to hardware. There are many different data structures, many different linguistic primitives, lots of algorithms work still to be done before we even know what we want to do. Um, no. But I think that by now there are enough people who are doing graphs who are using this sort of sparse array linear algebraic approach to doing graph algorithms that the time may be here for standardizing a set of interfaces and API for doing graphs in linear algebra. And so, and so this, is, this is where I'm going to end. There is in fact now a graph blahs forum chaired by uh, Tim Matson of Intel um, and a steering committee of a few people and a group of dozens of people who wrote a position paper, including, including our loyal opposition, John Barry is there somewhere, um, um, intending, intending, to, intending to, to define a standard. So, so I'll leave you with that, but I'll invite you to sign up. Um, and there's my conclusion. So, so uh, matrix computation is beginning to repay this 50-year-old debt. Um, and Sometimes things are clearer if you look at them from two directions. So, thank you very much. Mm. Mm. Mm.